The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to sing your praises, to read and to hear your word. And Lord, our prayer is um, that you would come. Lord, that you would rule and reign. Um, Someday we know that you will, but today we pray that in the hearts and lives of your people that you would rule and reign, that we would submit to your leadership and your lordship. And Father, now as we open your word once again, I pray that you would quiet our hearts and our minds, give us ears to hear, help us to pay attention on purpose this morning. Spirit of God, we know that without you and your working, all is done in vain. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would work in our midst, that you would guide and direct my thoughts and my mind and my words. Lord, I pray that Christ would be honored and magnified and that he would be high and lifted up and that all men and women would be drawn to him. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles this morning, let's look again at Habakkuk this morning. We have been here, and this is the penultimate message of Habakkuk. The truth is, I think that for our Christmas Day service, um, we will be back here, as strange as that might sound, as we close up the book in chapter 3. We've been studying the book of Habakkuk this morning, and uh, we have seen, or we've asked the question, I guess, what to do in our own lives when life falls apart, when the lid has been blown off. And here is Habakkuk, the great Old Testament prophet, who is surveying the lay of his culture and what's happening. And he sees a world of chaos and confusion. He sees doubt and despair. And as he looks around, here's the truth of the matter. It doesn't make any sense to him. None at all. And yet as he works his way through his complaints and God's responses... Here's a man who will go from his perplexity of the situation and his world ultimately to a place of praise for the God who is his salvation. And so his whole demeanor and his whole attitude is turned around by what the Lord says to him in chapter 2, verse number 2 through 4. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. And make it plain upon tables, that he may run that reads it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up or puffed up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And just quickly, let's look at chapter 3, verse 16, because there are two responses that Habakkuk has. The one is to wait, and we'll see that he actually did that, and will do that, and the other we'll talk about this morning. But verse 16 says this, When I heard him speaking of the Babylonians coming, the destruction, the loss of everything, literally everything, my lips quivered at the voice Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest, literally, quietly wait in the day of trouble. When he comes up onto the people, he will invade them with his troops. And so we see here that here is Habakkuk. God says, wait, the vision will come, wait for it. And so Habakkuk says, in the midst of what I see and what I hear and what I know is coming, I will wait. I will quietly rest in the Lord. And again, from last week, just to catch you up to speed, the idea here of waiting, of resting, um, it is not a waste of time. The truth is, when the Bible says the word wait, it is so close and synonymous with hope that this idea of waiting for the biblical authors is this. Then in the midst of my confusion, my despair, my depression, whatever is happening in my life, I will wait, I will hope, 
I will quietly rest in the God of heaven. I will trust completely in Him. Because we're not speaking about optimism this morning. Our hope and our waiting has an object. And that object is a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we as believers, in our hovering patterns, in our time of waiting, in our confusion of our unknown, we sit and we we wait in hope and anticipation and, and expecting. Because in this person, his faithfulness of the past will motivate us for hope for the future. We look to Christ and we think of the past, how he found us. And he found us because here was God, Emmanuel in the flesh, God who came among us, who lived with us, who breathed our air, who walked our sod, who became flesh, who robed himself. And in the greatest act of love, he gave himself. He was crucified. He died. And three days later, he arose from the tomb. This is the message of the church of Jesus Christ. And in that resurrection, the Bible calls that the first fruit. So we look back and say, Christ rose from the tomb bodily, got up out of the ground. Therefore, what will follow? As he, so shall we. My brother and sister in Christ, understand this. This life is not the end. And for those who we've lost, it is not the end. Because as Christ lives, they live and we too shall live. And our hope this morning is that as we are born again, this Savior will rebirth all of creation. All of it. It will be made new. And so his past faithfulness motivates hope for the future, but not just in the resurrection, but also in the reassurance over the years. My beloved, has he not been faithful to us? His past record is good. And no matter what happens, his past record is good. And so biblical waiting and hope are synonymous. And we're not wasting our time. It's an expectancy. And not only are we expecting and anticipating, but we are active in our waiting. We are active. And so we learned last week that while we're in these holding patterns, while we're practicing patience and waiting, we understand that, number one, that this patience or waiting is not an interruption of God's plan for our lives. It is his plan for our lives. Where you find yourself now, like right now, has not taken God by surprise. He knows. He knows. And this God of ours is personal. He, he doesn't just know as if God, who knows everything, the end from the beginning, the God of eternity, past, present, and future. He knows as one who walked among us, who felt our pain, who cried, who wept, who sweat, who bled, who was rejected and mocked and left by himself, betrayed. He knows it all. He knows it all. And so in our waiting, we understand it is not an interruption in God's life, in our life. It is part of his plan. And not only is it not an interruption, but it is not insignificant or of little importance. The fact of the matter is that in this process, wherever you find yourself, the God of heaven does not sleep, nor does he slumber. He is constantly active and he is working in your life and my life in the waiting, in the anticipation, in the looking to the future. We learn of him and his character. My brother and sister, in times like these, they drive us to our knees to look up to him. And as we do, we learn fully of him and we learn of ourselves. We learn of our own pride, our own arrogance, our own anger, our own impatience. We learn of the own, our own idols that we have placed in our lives that we believe will bring us comfort and rest and acceptance. We learn of ourselves. We learn to worship. You should be learning to worship right now. We said last week, when we find that God is all we have, we understand that he is all that we need. And that is not hyperbole. Some of you have been there. 
You have been at the bottom when you, when you felt as if it was all gone, and yet he was not gone. He is all that we need. We long for the rebirth of all creation, that the wrong will fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And as Habakkuk says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so this morning, what turned Habakkuk around was that he learned to wait and not to be idle, but to be active and to hope because God had been faithful in the past. He was looking for a sure future. This is the hope and the patience that runs. It runs. It doesn't sit. It is a patience that works under stress. It is a patience that in anguish, it still performs its daily task. And it is the patience that under hardships, it continues. It is not idle. It is not just a hope and a rest in a hospital bed or in a sick bed. But this is a hope and a rest and a waiting in the streets of where we find ourselves today. And so Habakkuk waited. My brother and sister, we were called to wait in hope, expectancy, and activity. But there's a second thing that God says to him in, in verse number four. And he says this. Behold, his soul which is lifted up or puffed up is not upright in, in him. And so in the context, the Lord is saying, I know about the Babylonians. I know they're evil. I know they're wicked. I know they're arrogant. I got this covered. I understand that. I will deal with them. But then he says, the just shall live by faith. And for, for almost everybody in this room, you have heard this phrase, you've seen this phrase, you think you understand this phrase, it was the battle cry of the Reformation, the just shall live by faith. But in its context, I think that has even more for us this morning. Notice, the just is not like the proud. First and foremost, he makes the comparison. He says, the Babylonians are puffed up. They're arrogant. And might I just be so bold to say... All of humanity is puffed up and proud and arrogant. They do, not, they do not need God. They have no need for God. They're marching along. They're, they're taking territory. They're getting what they want. They need not God. The fact is they're motivated by a world that doesn't have a God or doesn't have an accountability. They are arrogant, but the just are not like that. They solely trust in the Lord. And the fact is, for the just or the righteous, there is no room for pride. The reason is because when we say someone is just, that is a judicial sentence. We have to be declared just. So, the just shall live by faith. I can't declare that for myself, nor can you, and yet we try to do this. We think this morning that I am just or I am righteous with God because I'm Baptist. Or Catholic, or Reformed, or religious, or I do the right things, and I keep my list, and the good someday will outweigh the bad, and so therefore I am just. But the problem is, you and I cannot justify ourselves because there's a bigger problem than that. The, the reference that Andrew read this morning, Paul says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That word all means all of humanity. We all have all sinned. The word sin literally means to miss the mark. This morning, you and I were created in the image of God for two purposes. To love and worship Him. And to reflect that love and glory and worship to others. How are we doing with that? We have sinned. We have missed the mark. We have missed his glory. And humanity has thumbed its nose at the God of heaven and said, I will justify myself. And so in our rebellion, we have turned away from him. We all, we like sheep, have gone astray. There is none righteous, no, not one. And therefore, we cannot justify ourselves because the person that we've sinned against, the one who we've missed the mark with, is the God of heaven who is holy, righteous, and just. And will deal with all sin because he is loving. My friend, and you're going to see this later when we describe the Babylonians, sin is the cancer of this world. And everything it touches, it destroys. 
It promises you life and it produces death. And therefore, we have sinned in the eyes of God and we are accountable to him. All have sinned. Ultimately, God's holy law has been broken. Now notice, Romans 3.24, the only way to be declared righteous is through him. Verse 24 says, being justified, just as if we've never sinned, to be made righteous, this legal declaration, it's freely by his grace through the redemption of Christ Jesus. My friend, quit trying to work for a salvation that you can never earn. And for folks in our church, I'm fearful. There are some people here that you've grown up in church and you believe that somehow, some way, you are just justified because of your catechisms, because of your baptism, because of your good works. It will not work for you. You and I must be born again. And here's the kicker. There aren't any works involved in that. It's not what I can do because it has been done through the person of Jesus Christ. He came. He came because I could not go to him in my condition. And the God of heaven came to us. He lived the perfect life, completely fulfilled God's law. And then in the ultimate self-sacrifice, laid down his own life. No one took it from him. It was not the Romans. It was not the Jew. It was our sin. And he willfully laid his life down for you and for me. And how arrogant to think that if that's what it took for me to be reconciled back to God, that somehow I will do and I will add and I will be? No, we are declared just for those who put their faith and trust in the Christ who came, who lived, who died, who bore the wrath, and then rose again. Notice, we are declared just by his grace. It is grace alone. It is not works. It's not my merit. It's not how I favor God's acceptance. It is all by grace. The unmerited favor of God. Nothing I can do to earn it. I can't work for it. So quit. Trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. And then at verse 27 of our text in Romans, he says, where is boasting then? The Babylonians are full of pride. The world's full of pride. We did. Look at us. He said, where's the boasting? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No. No, no, no. There, there are no works involved. But by the law of faith, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And so we come this morning, there is no place for arrogance or pride in those who are called just or righteous. Because we have been declared that not on our own, but by the God of heaven. And there is no place for arrogance as we treat other people. As if somehow we've arrived and we've made it. And look at the rest of those uh, despicable people out there. No, what we understand is because there is no pride involved, that we were all in the same boat. It is one beggar telling another beggar where they found food because our feet were lifted up out of the miry clay, out of the horrible pit, and set upon a rock. How dare we despise anyone? It's all his grace. And so the just are not like the proud. And you can continue to be prideful this morning, and do it your way, but you will never be justified. Justification comes when God declares us righteous through the person and work of Jesus Christ and simple faith in calling out on him. So, the just are not like the proud. Number two, um, the just don't look like the proud. He says, the just shall live, shall live. We should just stop there because apart from God, there is no life. The God of heaven is the giver of all life. This morning, if you have a pulse, and some of you I'm not sure about, <laughs> but if you have a pulse this morning, it's a gift of God. What are you doing to keep it? I exercise, I eat right, I'm cutting down on the cheeseburgers. Most disturbing news I got that McDonald's was, oh, I shouldn't even go there, never mind. Okay. <laughs> it's not, I don't want to besmirch any restaurant nor condemn myself. And so, I'm exercising, I'm eating right, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm going to extend my life. My friend, we have no control over this life. None. In a moment, in an instant, it can be gone. He is the giver of life. The just shall live. And this life, not only is the giver, but he is good. 
some people act as if Christianity and the Christian life is so constrictive and you've got, you know, your 613 rules and then you've added some beyond that and it's just so hard and so rigid. But that's not how Jesus describes true life in him. He is life. He is the giver of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And as he describes his relationship with us in John chapter 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. I know them by name. They follow me. And I give unto them life. And then he says he's the door. And then he makes this statement that those who are in him go in and out and find pasture. That's freedom. It's liberty. The Christian knows true life because true life is living in accordance to the way we were designed that now I am free to truly live. Truly live. But not so with those who live outside of true life. At all. It's amazing in our text, chapter 2, after verse number 4, he then goes about these woes to the Babylonians and really all those who seek life apart from the source of life. And he describes them for us. Listen to me. There are not two ethics in the world today where this is the ethic of God's people and this is the ethic of the lost. There is one ethic. We were created in the image of God and God expects all of humanity to love him and to love one another. God expects all humanity to be just and righteous and holy. And whether we understand it or not, this was our mandate from him, that we were to be co-regents and rulers with him. This is the um, uh, ethic that he has for us. The The creator expects this. But now he says, here's what the Babylonians do, and here's what the rest of the world does, and there's a manifestation of life without God. We won't read verses 5 through 19, but here's what he says. They're greedy. Life without... Without God, which is not life, they're greedy people. Greedy. Not only that, they're covetous. They're covetous people. All they think about is more and more and more, and your stuff should be their stuff, and if they don't have it, they hate you for having it. They're covetous. They use people for their own gain. You'll see where the Babylonians use people by their blood, their sweat, and their tears to build their kingdom. And the fact of the matter is, we all do this. This is life in our world. I was talking with our folks in our Sunday school about manipulation and and how we, whether we know it or not, will manipulate people. I gave an example of this, and so just bear with me for those who are in there, but when we were younger, uh, I have two brothers who are younger. I'm the oldest, and I have a sister who is way younger than me, like 15 years younger than me. Crazy story, but well, anyways. So um, we were... were, um, held responsible for our own lunches every day. We had to make our own lunches. And so, as a firstborn, I told my, 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 my middle brother, Scott, I said, Scott, we've got to make sandwiches. You make the best sandwiches in the world. He said, no, you're just, no, really, Scott, you make the best sandwiches in the world. And you know, my brother fell for that for years and years and years. And the fact is, his sandwiches were like, eh, I don't know. I was lazy. I was lazy. And, and so, This is our world. We use people for our own gain. It's not life. He goes on to describe drunkenness and sexual impurity, which go hand in hand. But the world that has no life, they turn to alcohol, they have no reason in their head, and they are sexually perverse and impure. And then he says, idolatry. They're seeking meaning and comfort and acceptance outside of God. And this is a description of life outside of God, because it is not life. This world thinks they're so enlightened and erudite. The truth is that they're actually exterminating themselves. This is what our world celebrates as true life. Flourishing is rejected. And I want to tell you something, my friend, this morning, you can reject the only life that's in God, and you can think and believe it's going to give you what you want, and it will fulfill you and satisfy you, but there's no human flourishing there. And those lives eventually wither and shrivel and dry up and die. The just shall live by faith. The just are meant to live and to flourish. And so the world outside of Christ, the world outside of God, they think they're living. There is no life there. If you want to keep on deceiving yourself, go ahead. But I'm telling you, you will end up dying, shriveling up and drying up. But for the righteous this morning, and righteous in Christ, 
the just are meant to flourish. And, and we must remember, because sometimes we're deceived by this, we think somehow that we can find happiness and joy outside of him. And the fact of the matter is you can't. Not eternal, not lasting, not, not real substance happiness because God cannot give you happiness outside of himself because it does not exist. He is the fountain of all goodness and joy. And so the just shall live, and we are meant to live and to flourish, but the just shall live by faith. The just are not like the proud. The just don't look like the proud. And then finally this morning, the just don't live like the proud. As we relate to life, even in its difficulties, this is the message that transformed Habakkuk and the remnant that were there in their confusion, their chaos, their, their perplexity. And this is the message that will transform us in our world today. The just shall live by faith. Faith is active trust. It is a decision in the God who has revealed himself through Scripture. And this faith produces faithfulness in our lives. Living by faith and being faithful to God and his word is synonymous The just shall live by faith. Yes, I trust God. But that trust then manifests itself by a life that in faith is living in line with who he is and what he has said. This is not just a cry to get saved and have fire insurance that the just shall live by faith. This is a call for all of our lives this morning that in daily life, in the grind of this world, the just the one who's been redeemed, the one who's been declared righteous in God's eyes because of Christ, that person now is to live, now, today, by faith. By faith. Where I acknowledge what he has said, I acknowledge it's true, I acknowledge it's good, his word and his commandments, I then follow. They're not grievous. They are good. And so, we live by faith. Righteousness or faithfulness is not an optional feature for believers no matter where they find themselves or the situation around them. It's not as if Habakkuk said, Lord, this is really bad, I'm losing everything, and so I'm going to live like it's 1999 and party away because there is no purpose. No! He said, it's really bad. And God says, yes, the just shall live by faith. And this is the call for us. Day to day, we are to be faithful, living in, in, in God's way in good times and bad times. Believer, in the midst of your confusion and chaos, are you living by faith? One of our old farmers, no, he's not an old farmer, he's a farmer, he's not old. Uh, when you're 50, um, no one's old anymore. No one. It's like, oh, 90? Boy, he's young, really young. Uh, And everyone's young now. They're 30, they're kids, right? So this farmer was telling me years ago, he said, an old farmer told him that every morning when you wake up, you might not know what the law is. Which is true. It could change. Or you might not know what the lockdowns are. That could change, right? That would never happen, but the goalposts would never change. And so you might not know what is legal, but every morning when you wake up, you will know what is right. This world is always shifting and changing. Our culture is always changing. We we actually don't have truth anymore. It's whatever you believe and whatever you want to perceive, and you can be what you want to be. You want to be a unicorn? Be a unicorn. That's awesome. The problem is it's not reality. There is truth. There is truth. And it's hard. It's not soft. It's truth. We must live by truth. And so... We live in a world that's like that. You might not know what is right as far as the law is concerned. But believer, this morning, when you woke up, you know what was true by God's law. The just shall live by faith. And maybe part of our confusion this morning, and I'm, I'm talking about our confusion, mine, and our chaos and our despair and our trouble and this heavy spirit of weariness that that many of us have felt for two years. Maybe part of that, I'm just guessing, could be that we don't know how to wait on the Lord in expectancy of what he's doing in our lives. That we have not been living by faith. That every day when we wake up, no matter what is swirling outside of those walls, outside of these walls, or in your home, or in your heart, 
We are called to live by faith. And so I don't want to leave you this morning with not understanding what I'm saying this morning, so let me, let's be practical. What does it mean for the believer to live by faith? Let's just take a few of, of, of God's commandments for us that we know. We might not know it's legal, but we know what God expects. Number one, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Don't try it. Jesus answered that already. Go read about the Good Samaritan. That's answered. Quit it. If you're wondering, the answer is yes. Church of Jesus Christ, quit hating on people. And I'm serious. Listen, I don't care where they stand. And I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I don't care if they're black, white, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, Kind, sweet, ugly, indifferent, vaccinated, unvaccinated, masked or unmasked. I I don't care. Love your neighbor. Quit hating on people. I mean, that's a command of Christ. Love your neighbor. Paul picks it up and says, as much as life in you live peaceably with all men. One of the problems in the culture that we talked about for Habakkuk was that people were devouring one another over trivial matters. And not that we would understand that today, but there are people who are actually devouring one another over trivial matters. Things that do not matter. Listen, um, we have family. We all have family. And you know how family is. It's dysfunctional. All of it. Yours, mine. One of our dear ladies said the other day, that uh, in her family, they took the fun out of dysfunction. <laughs> There's not even fun anymore. It used to be fun because we tell stories and, yeah, we know that's going to happen. This is great memories. It's, uh, no, there is no fun in that. But believer, are we living by faith? We don't have to be the member at the Christmas party who causes chaos and confusion. And some of you are waiting for it. You like you have your lines ready. When she says this, I'm ready for it. That's great. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Do you know the Bible's not really complicated at all, and that's the problem. It's not the parts we don't understand, it's the parts that we clearly understand. Some of you folks, I love you, but you need a holiday from Facebook. Like like a month, or a year, or forever, maybe. And I'm not saying, tell truth, speak truth. We need to hear the truth. We absolutely need truth today. But do you understand, we are all in these echo chambers where we think everyone thinks like us, and they don't. I'll be honest, I, I, I thought just not too long ago that certainly this is the way our culture will, will respond. And I was shocked that it didn't. Um, listen, live peaceably with all men. And I'm not telling you to compromise truth or your convictions, but, but there's a way to speak, even truth, to speak it in love and seasoned with grace. Honor your parents. And of course, we think of teenagers, and teenagers, you should honor your parents. Don't be showing up at youth group acting like you're spiritual when you're screaming at your mom and dad and don't listen to a word they say. If you're born again, you are to live by faith to honor them, to respect them, to listen. Believe it or not, they might, I'm not sure this is true, but I think for most teenagers, your parents might be older than you are. I'm not, I've never been good at math, but I think that that might be it. And they actually might have more life experience than you have. And certainly, they're not perfect. Parents do the dumbest things and say the dumbest things and respond in the dumbest ways. But God will honor you as you honor them. And so, Honor your parents. And then we have to say, what about the 50-year-old who has parents? And we should honor them as well. I might not know it's legal when I wake up, but I know it's right to just live by faith. Be a man or woman of integrity. Work. I know it's, it's, it's really acceptable now to just take a handout from the government, but you cannot feel good about yourself. 
You and I need to work. We were created to create. We were created for a purpose. Work. And when you go to work tomorrow morning or tonight, be honest. Work a full day's work for a full day's pay, whatever you're being paid. Be honest. Work hard. Don't get wrapped up in the gossip of work and all of the drama. You should be a peacemaker there as well. The just shall live by faith. Provide, protect, teach your family. This is a command for the believer to live by faith. Someone is teaching your children constantly. And can I tell you something? Just, and I'm not, I don't want to go on. This is destroying our youth. I, I need, this is my brain now, right? Oh, duh, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. I get it. But the fact is, we have kids now who never pay attention to anything other than this. And it's addictive. And we have to be careful. Parents, you are responsible. You have no idea what they're being taught. Most of us have no idea. You think bringing them to church for one hour is going to transform their lives? You're insane. The school has them for eight hours a day. Five days a week. Social media has them for longer than that. And we are called to provide, to protect, to teach, to train. That, that um, What's Deuteronomy chapter 6? Um, this law shall be in your heart. Before you ever talk about your children, teaching them in the way and at dinner, it has to be in your heart. So moms and dads, grandparents, teach your kids. Care for the broken and hurting. The world is broken. And the world is hurting. I think it was Spurgeon who said, preach to the broken heart and you'll always have an audience. Open your eyes, believer. You have neighbors and friends who are broken and suffering. Seek forgiveness, reconciliation, repent, give, worship, pray, meditate, die to self, and live for others. This is living by faith. And for too many of us, we say, thank God, saved by faith, faith alone, and grace alone, and Christ alone. It doesn't stop there. That's the beginning. And daily, as I wait in anticipation, as I'm actively involved with God as he's teaching me things, I then live by faith. And my brother and sister this morning, I am convinced that this type of life will not only change your life in the midst of your circumstances. And remember, Habakkuk's circumstances do not change. A matter of fact, he will literally lose everything. And yet, waiting on God and living by faith, he ends this oracle by saying, I will praise the God of my salvation. Because his perspective has changed. And if you and I would start living out our faith daily, no matter what's swirling around us, it would change our lives, and I promise you, it would change the lives of the world around us. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had a chance to go see my dad. And I have to be honest with you. I, I thank you for your prayers. There was a space where I thought we would lose him. Like, really lose him. Three days were really bad. And so, we took a trip. We got down there. It was, it was exhausting. We spent some time with him. It was beautiful. And we were just drained. Kim and I were drained. And so, we get to the border. And, and you know the border. You can get a guard there that, oh my goodness, I don't know who messed up their coffee this morning, but they're just not right. Right? You just never know, because they're human beings. So we got a guard at the, at, the, at the toll. He said, okay, why were you gone? And I said, hey, we went to see my dad. He's in ICU. You know, we had an aneurysm, and uh, went to see him for the day. And uh, he said, I'm sorry to hear that. I was like, oh, okay. And then I don't know that he asked us another question at all. And when we were leaving, this guard said to me, I hope your dad's okay. Now listen to me. Kim and I pulled away, first rejoicing, he didn't check our receipts, and then second, (laughs) her receipts. And secondly, we wept. We wept because of the kindness of one man I'm not exaggerating. It was like cool water to a thirsty soul. And it just, it blessed us. Believer, I wonder if those who know real life, 
who know it, we have it. It lives within us through a person. If we today would wait in hope and expectancy in activity, we would wait on him. Our hope is in a person. And we would seek daily to live by faith. I wonder what kind of life we could bring to the world around us. And so, this morning, stop sitting on your hands. Stop bemoaning how bad the world is. Stop in your cycle of despair being paralyzed and saying, look how bad the world, and look what the world has come to. Instead, this morning, those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, who are waiting in anticipation for the rebirth of all things, who are living by faith, should say, don't look how bad the world is and look what the world's come to, but look at who has come to the world. The Savior Jesus Christ, who has life, and life abundantly. And by faith, we live this out so that we can bring flourishing where God has planted us. And so, I would encourage you to wait on the Lord. And if you're just and you're righteous because of Him, then we should live by faith daily. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word and your truth. And Lord, I pray that in my own heart and life, I would, I would grasp this truth of the just living by faith, that, that I can't separate my trust in you and my, my actions in my life. And Lord, for a church, what an army this would be in this community if we would take your word seriously and we would wait and anticipate with hope and excitement that you are at work and that you have a plan and that we would live daily by faith, trusting you, trusting your word, and no matter the outcome, that we would demonstrate the life that Christ has given us. And so, Spirit of God, do what you must in our hearts this morning. Help us to be convicted or encouraged. Help those who don't know you to see their need of real life, understanding the life of the big party will end. It's hopeless, it's despair, it's death. Help them to see the life that Jesus offers. And help us to understand that life as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.